Ladies and gentlemen, the Director General of the International Labor Organization, Mr. Guy Ryder. Professor uh, Fluktier, Rector of the uh, University of Geneva, Professor Baigorri Halon of the University of Salamanca, uh, President of the AIC. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say that uh, I have attended many meetings in this room. Practically all of them have operated because of the conference interpretation services uh, which have been available to them. But this is, to my knowledge at least, the first meeting which has been dedicated precisely to the issue of conference interpretation. And you might think it's about time that we turned our attention to you. It is a particular pleasure to welcome you all to the International Labour Organization, uh, particularly in the ILO centenary year. And we are absolutely delighted to co-host this conference uh, with the Faculty of Translation and Interpreting of the University of Geneva. Let me say it seems to me particularly appropriate that we meet here at the ILO, because we share common origins. The ILO is we are all aware, was born out of the uh, Treaty of Versailles, the Conference of Versailles of 1919. It uh, gave birth to our organization, but it also gave birth to the profession of multilingual, multilateral uh, diplomacy, and hence of conference interpretation, because as I'm sure the historians amongst us uh, are aware, and as we will hear later on, no doubt, this was a point at which English was given, attributed the same uh, authority uh, in international affairs as French had had up until that point. Uh, of course, things have got somewhat more complicated since then, but these are the origins. As I say, with the Versailles peace process came the birth of a new profession, your profession, the profession of conference interpreter. I've often thought that uh, Queen Victoria said it was a place of children to be seen and not heard. You're sort of in the opposite situation. You are often heard, but not so frequently seen. So it's great to see you all at this point. Um, I'm tempted to say, although it's not really true for those of us who know you and your profession, that interpretation services are sometimes taken for granted. Uh, you tend to get noticed, the interpretation function tends to get noticed when something goes wrong, which it doesn't do so frequently, I must say. But we all know, we all know that when the interpretation stops, the discussion stops. When the interpretation is not there, the progress grinds to a halt. If interpretation is not of the quality that we need, and that's never the case at the ILO, but I know from other places, well, our work suffers. And when interpretation is at the levels of excellence and reliability that we get here, then our organization benefits in consequence. And in addition to this coincidence of our centenaries, um, I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that the histories of the ILO and of conference interpretation have remained closely intertwined ever since. Some may not be aware that the International Labour Organization was the very first user of simultaneous interpretation. And in fact, it's here that the means of it taking place was invented. Ours is a tripartite house. You're sitting in the government seats. You are the employers. You are the workers. You may not know it, and you may wish to change seat as a consequence. But ours is a tripartite house, and what does that mean? It means that many of the people who come to the ILO are not the diplomats, not the government representatives, who may have more language skills than a trade unionist or an employer might have. And it was in 1925, I understand, that one of the employer representatives, Mr. Edward Albert Filen, considered that the consecutive interpretation of all of the statements made into two languages was simply too time-consuming, and he looked for an alternative. And uh, I actually have some evidence from the very 
the second, I think, international labor conference that took place in 1920 in Genoa, it was a maritime labor conference, of the absolute chaos that reigned in the meeting for a number of reasons. It was a hot day, it was a hot conversation, nobody could hear the interpretation, and so we needed to look for better ways to get the job done. And it was together with a British officer, Alan Gordon Finlay, who was an engineer by profession of origin, and at the time translator at the ILO, that he and Filane repurposed existing telephone equipment to develop a system which allowed conference participants to listen to the interpretation as the speech unfolded, in real time, I guess, as we would say today. And this they called telephone interpretation. And the system was then developed by IBM, whose director at that time was a friend of Edward Philae. Then in 1927, with the green light of the then, the very first director general of the ILO, Albert Thomas, the system was used during our annual international labor conference. For the first time, all participants had the opportunity to receive and hopefully to understand the message that was being given simultaneously to its delivery. And this was particularly important for the ILO owing to its tripartite nature. Thus was born simultaneous interpretation. It later, of course, came to be used by other bodies and well known, I would say notorious, of course, because we see it so frequently in the newsreel uh, that has resulted from it. We saw it at the Nuremberg trials and I understand that an exhibition of interpretation at Nuremberg is currently open to the public at the University of, of Geneva. Now, it's important for all of us, of course, to remember uh, that your profession is work. And the ILO, in addition to the coincidence of our origins, has a particular responsibility uh, to all professions to ensure that work is undertaken in decent conditions and that your terms and conditions are decided by appropriate international, uh, excuse me, industrial relations processes. And that is why we value very highly our relationship with AIC. Uh, I think it's not surprising and it's certainly entirely appropriate that the ILO has subscribed to the agreement of the Association Internationale des Interprètes de Conférence and the UN Common System from the very start. This agreement is a unique example of negotiation uh, in the United Nations system as a whole of a collective agreement regulating uh, the conditions of self-employed professionals. And let me take the opportunity to reiterate that the ILO is wholly committed to respecting this agreement and to continue our very positive relationship with AIC in the future. This is simply a matter of coherence with the ILO's own mandate and agenda, but it is also, as we all know, uh, ensuring decent working conditions, fair practices, a precondition and a guarantee of the quality of the services that we receive from you. I would add as well that the ILO is the largest United Nations single agency employer for freelance interpreters within the system. In 2018 alone, more than 8,000 interpreter days ensured the provision of high-class services in all languages that we cover. And during our annual conferences, and we're still recovering from the rigors of our centenary conference in June, more than 6,000 delegates from all over the world communicate and work together thanks to the work that you do. It's not surprising, given all of the circumstances that I have briefly outlined, that Geneva is a very busy hub for interpreters. In a country of peace, Geneva has been a place for dialogue. It has been all along. And the ILO, as a house of dialogue, has found a natural home here. And the ILO has been pleased to work closely with the University of Geneva for the training of the future generations of conference interpreters. And in 2017, our cooperation was formalized with a memorandum of understanding. And thanks to it, aspiring interpreters at the University of Geneva learn about the nature of multilingual, multilateral diplomacy in the only tripartite organization of the UN system. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in this our centenary year, 
the ILO has taken a look back at its history of 100 years. We're proud of that history. It's a, a rich history. But we're also looking forward, as I'm sure you are, to the future of work, which raises so many questions in our societies and amongst our populations. Uh, and of course, we will be reflecting, I'm sure you will be reflecting today and tomorrow on the future of the uh, interpretation profession. I think the most frequently asked question, the issue which is most quickly addressed when it comes to the future of work, is the impact of technology. And I suspect that will be in your minds. Uh, I've seen from the wonderful exhibition that's set up uh, uh, outside this room, uh, I think we can all see how, inter how interpretation has benefited, and I would underline the word benefited, from the application of technologies over the last hundred years. It's been an extraordinary story of advance, and I think we can see how technology has contributed to improving the work experience of interpreters and improving the quality of the services delivered. Of course, we're looking at some new issues now. To what extent can technology in the future be applied not just to facilitate established processes, but to change them? That is to say, the application, the possible application uh, of machine, uh, 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 machine services in the act of interpretation. I remain, but you know much more than I do, uh, somewhat skeptical about the impact that this will have. It seems to me, and I've been a consumer of your services for three and a half decades, uh, and the word interpretation gives us some strong hints. You interpret that the work that you do, the services you provide, are not perhaps so easily susceptible to automation in the way that some uh, suggest. And I'm old-fashioned enough to believe that something will be lost in terms of the nuance, the meaning, the inflections that we all think that we give to our interventions in halls such as this. But we have to, of course, look to what change in the future will bring, and we have to ensure uh, that the future of work and the future of interpretation is what we wish it to be, not what some might think can be um, imposed through interpretation. Let me close, ladies and gentlemen, with just a couple of comments, if you'll allow me, of my personal experience, and it, it is more than 30 years. I first came uh, to this organization as a rigorously monolingual member of a worker delegation in 1982. And for the first time, I came into contact with uh, uh, the experience of simultaneous conference interpretation. And I don't mind admitting, I was in awe. This was, to me, magic. How could you put this thing in your ear and listen to uh, the interventions being made in so many different languages? Who were these people in the boxes? What sort of exotica did the booths contain? And over the years, frankly, I've never lost that sense of awe at what I still continue to refer to as the, the magic of interpretation services. And I want to express my admiration and my gratitude for the services that you have and continue to provide. I'm also conscious of the experience of using your services. I still retain the memories of the great anecdotes of a microphone inadvertently left open in a booth and the entertainment and embarrassment that can sometimes ensue. The fact, and it's a reality, that delegates have that sort of comfort blanket of knowing that however incoherent or illogical they may be speaking in their own language, somebody in a booth is going to make a bit more sense of it somehow. <laughs> Very important added value to us all. Those rather panicked looks from the boxes, those urgent requests, could you please tell the delegate to slow down a bit, and we all sort of ignore you and say, he's doing okay, don't worry about it. Uh, but we have to work with these things. Um, and all of this, I think, adds up to the human experience of interpretation. This is important. I cringe, I always cringe at the moment, and it happens far too frequently, when the delegate says, a delegate who's been caught out in an incoherence and illogicality, piece of nonsense in saying, yeah, you know, something went wrong in the interpretation. And I, I cringe on your behalf when this is said. So I thank you also for your tolerance in the face of this mistreatment from those that you serve. Finally, uh, I want to say a word of thanks to those who provide 
the interpretation services or organize the interpretation services uh, in this house. Um, it is a miracle, is it not? And our ILO conference in June proved it, uh, that our interpretation services get the right people to the right meeting in the right room at the right time without fail. So to our chief interpreter, Monica, I want to end my contribution by expressing my sincere appreciation. I hope you can have a great conference. I want to stay and listen and to learn from you. And I look forward to consuming your services in the years ahead. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Director General. Messieurs, Mesdames, le recteur de l'Université de Genève, le professeur Yves Flukiger. Monsieur le directeur général du BIT, Mesdames et Messieurs les directrices générales, Mesdames et Messieurs les directeurs, Mesdames et Messieurs les chefs de section, chefs de service, chefs interprètes, chers représentants des associations professionnelles du monde académique, du monde de la pratique. Tout d'abord, au nom de l'Université de Genève, permettez-moi de présenter mes plus sincères félicitations à l'Organisation internationale du travail qui nous accueille aujourd'hui. C'est un centenaire important que nous devons célébrer aujourd'hui plus que jamais. Je suis particulièrement heureux de pouvoir vous présenter ces félicitations en français. Français qui a commencé à s'imposer effectivement dans la langue des conférences internationales il y a 100 ans à la conférence de paix de Versailles et qui a depuis lors conservé sa place dans le monde de la diplomatie multilatérale, multilingue. Vous me permettrez peut-être de dire en cette année d'anniversaire l'importance du multilatéralisme. Plus que jamais, ce multilatéralisme est absolument indispensable pour pouvoir répondre à tous les défis que le monde doit affronter aujourd'hui. Et ce multilatéralisme doit pouvoir s'appuyer sur l'interprétation. L'interprétation, plus que jamais, a tout son sens dans le monde multilatéral. J'aimerais aussi reconnaître en cette année d'anniversaire le rôle fondamental que joue l'OIT. Mesdames et messieurs, L'OIT est effectivement une longue histoire, mais c'est aussi aujourd'hui dans l'innovation numérique qui secoue notre société, un rôle absolument indispensable que de re-réfléchir et de se reposer des questions relatives aux emplois décents, au développement de la protection sociale, comment implémenter une protection sociale lorsque le numérique se développe, et le renforcement du dialogue social. Une belle histoire, cent années d'histoire du BIT, mais c'est aussi évidemment un très bel avenir. Aujourd'hui, plus que jamais, le monde a besoin de votre organisation, monsieur le directeur général. Rappelez aussi, cela a été fait par le directeur général, que le, la particularité de l'OIT, c'est ce dialogue entre des organisations d'employeurs, d'employés et du gouvernement. Ce, cette organisation tripartite qui est tout à fait unique, dans le système onusien, un tripartisme qui est aussi la possibilité pour la société civile de participer au développement de notre monde. Et ce tripartisme, à côté du multilatéralisme, est une pierre essentielle de la construction de notre monde de demain. Vous l'avez compris, évidemment, tout ceci n'est possible que grâce à l'interprétation. Et peut-être que vous me permettrez de remonter un tout petit peu dans l'histoire, ce sera sans doute fait par notre collègue tout à l'heure, pour rappeler simplement les liens historiques qui unissent l'OIT et l'Université de Genève en matière d'interprétation, puisque le fondateur de l'école d'interprètes de Genève, les TI à l'époque, le professeur Antoine Velleman, a très régulièrement travaillé à l'OIT en tant qu'interprète. Et ce lien persiste aujourd'hui encore et toujours, et c'est une bénédiction pour l'Université de Genève, puisque l'ancien chef interprète et l'actuel chef interprète de l'OIT enseigne au département d'interprétation de notre faculté de traduction et d'interprétation. Cette expérience est évidemment absolument indispensable pour nos étudiants. C'est une valeur ajoutée extraordinaire 
pour les étudiants qui viennent dans notre faculté, dans notre université. Et nous souhaitons encore et toujours renforcer ces liens entre les organisations internationales, l'OIT et notre université de Genève. J'aimerais aussi faire référence à ce Memorandum of Understanding qui a été évoqué tout à l'heure par le directeur général du BIT, un mémorandum qui permet effectivement la formation de jeunes interprètes, nos étudiants, qui ont un accès privilégié à votre organisation et qui leur permettent effectivement de travailler dans des conditions réelles avec des gens comme moi qui parlent le français parfois trop vite et je m'en excuse. C'est une collaboration extrêmement bénéfique que nous souhaitons encore et toujours développer. Une collaboration d'ailleurs que nous avons euh, cristallisée avec un certain nombre de plateformes. Permettez-moi très rapidement de les évoquer. Le Geneva Science Policy Interface, le Geneva Science Diplomacy euh, Anticipator et le Swiss Digital Inno euh, Initiative. Trois plateformes qui ont précisément pour objectif de mettre en lien les organisations internationales le monde académique et la société civile pour répondre à ces défis de demain. Je suis très heureux que durant ces deux jours, vous aurez l'occasion de discuter cet avenir en regardant à la fois vers le passé mais aussi vers le futur. Mesdames et messieurs, longue vie au multilatéralisme, plus que jamais indispensable pour répondre aux défis de demain. Mesdames et messieurs, longue vie à l'OIT, plus que jamais indispensable pour pouvoir affronter le monde numérique. Mesdames et messieurs, longue vie aux interprètes qui ne seront jamais remplacés par la technologie, nous l'évoquions tout à l'heure, la technologie jamais ne parviendra à appréhender les différents accents de la, du francophone que je suis avec l'accent suisse, j'imagine, du francophone que je suis quand il parle l'anglais, évidemment. Donc longue vie aux interprètes, nous avons besoin de vous pour pouvoir progresser ensemble pour le bien-être de la collectivité. Je vous souhaite une excellente conférence et je remercie tous les organisatrices et organisateurs qui ont mis cette conférence en place. Merci beaucoup et très bonne journée. Merci, Monsieur le Directeur. Mesdames et Messieurs, le Président de l'Union internationale de conférences interpréteurs, Uros Petter. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, with, with a profound sense of pride and humility that I stand here before you, not out of fear, but uh, because all of us know that 100 years and more is a long time for a profession of ours, and many greats have worked in this profession over this past century. Rector Flukiger already listed all those who need to be thanked and welcomed, so I will uh, just second that to save us a little bit of time. I would like to extend particular thanks to the ILO and to its Director General, Guy Ryder. I thank you very much for the commitment that you've expressed to your partnership with AIC. I stress partnership, and this is something I stress all the time in my talks with the organizations with whom we have agreements. We are partners. We are not adversaries. We are partners serving those who, work, who we work for. I would also like to thank the conference organizing committee Kilian Zeber, Vice Dean of FTI, Monica Vasela Garcia, the Chief Interpreter at the ILO, and uh, Roxanne Santan. Uh, many thanks also to the Scientific Committee for all their hard work in preparing this conference. A hundred years ago, I suppose all the professional interpreters in this world couldn't have uh, filled all the seats in this room. Some 35 years later, in 1953, when uh, AIC was founded, its 35 founding members even with the proverbial inflated egos of interpreters, couldn't have filled all the seats in this room either. Now, today, 66 uh, years on, our association alone brings together 3,000 conference interpreters from all over the world, with uh, over 1,000 joining in just the last 10 years. Moving on to about half of this uh, 100 years that have passed, 50 years ago precisely, AIC concluded its first two agreements with the EU and the UN. Uh, I think that was one of the major milestones in our profession where we moved from a profession of niche talent to a profession that actually became a profession. Now, although historical accounts, and Jesus will speak about that later, show that our profession may indeed go back thousands of years, some even venture so far as to say that we were the second oldest profession in the world, 
Uh, well, over these past 100 years, we have traveled truly an incredible journey. We've gone from, as I said, a niche skill based mainly on sheer talent to a fully fledged profession that is today taught, researched, and practiced by thousands of the world over. But still, interpreter memoirs are few and far between, professional secrecy being one of the main guiding principles and, in fact, prerequisites of our profession. Now, speaking of historical memory, we have with us these two days an incredible individual, someone who has a first-hand experience of and someone who helped shape no less than 70 of these 100 years of conference interpreting. AIC founding member and its honorary president, Christopher Thierry. Christopher. This, this gentleman, of, of no less than 92, I'm permitted to say that, managed to conjure up the English edition of our 300-page page book on the history of conference interpreting entitled The Birth of a Profession, Updates and All Included, with the dedicated help of the team of the AIC History Group in just a few short months. And uh, this book will be available to you tomorrow, uh, logistics permitting, I think we've agreed on that, uh, just outside this room. Now, turning to the present and the future, our profession has in a way become a victim of its own success, I think. It remains an attractive and exciting profession, sometimes even lucrative. Interpreting schools the world over are delivering qualified and uh, well-trained interpreters in large numbers, often going far beyond what the market demands, which inevitably leads to the, pre uh, to the precarization of our profession. So how apt that we're sitting here at the ILO. We're facing also the challenge of remote simultaneous interpreting, artificial intelligence in interpretation, and even interpreter confidentiality is being undermined almost on a daily basis recently. Remember the issue with the Trump interpreter a while ago. Just last week in Poland, uh, a court decided that an interpreter cannot be subpoenaed to testify about the substance of a discussion that she interpreted between two heads of state. And there are unconfirmed accounts of uh, the interpreter who worked for uh, uh, Kim Jong-un disappearing after the meeting with Trump. I, I insist unconfirmed, but that is something that is circulating as information. I think this shows that, in fact, war and peace have been at the center of conference interpreting over the past 100 and even more years. If you look at 1919 Versailles, it was with the aim of creating peace that interpretation was used. The League of Nations, the Nuremberg Trials, the EU and the UN, both of which are eminent peace projects. Then the war crimes tribunals for the former Yugoslavia. I think all this should lead us maybe to conclude with, with this thought. Perhaps the sharpest weapon in any arsenal is a qualified, professional, and sharp interpreter. Thank you very much.